So I guess the first thing we need to do is, um, if we're going to have evidence-based practice, we need to identify what is evidence. And there's no, there's no one thing that is evidence. Evidence is effectively the available body of facts that um, indicates whether something is true or valid or not. Um, it seems it's really important that the work in the work that we do because we need to be able to say to families and children that the services that we're offering them actually have positive outcomes for them. So. Evidence is really important in that sense. Um, and we need the evidence to support the claims that we're making in the services that we offer. Um, there are different types of evidence. Um, so I've just got a list of a few up here. Published research, which tends to be rigor rigorous, um, peer-reviewed, replicated um, research. Locally gathered data, so um, data from your local regions. Um, relevant theories, so lots of theories that underpin the practices that you, you do. Um, expert opinion, so when there isn't a theory or a clear um, base of evidence, the, um, the expert opinion of those who are working in the field is often taken into consideration. Practic practitioner wisdom, as you know, is very important. Then we've got, you know, Wikipedia and Google results, which you can actually get quite a bit of evidence and information from, but we wouldn't necessarily suggest that you use that as your only source of evidence for your practice. Um, so, um, Moving on, Jack Shonkoff, who's a US child development expert, he um, identified a way of looking at three levels of evidence. Um, so basically what he's saying is that one is established knowledge, which is um, de defined by the scientific community against strict criteria. So this is what we call faulty research. It's well conducted, it's replicated, and hopefully applicable to other populations that you're working with. It's, it's really what we say, what we know, but know being loosely used there. And then we have what we consider reasonable hypotheses. And this is um, when we make assertions about what we don't yet know, but we're basing it on what we do know. So we're basing on, on established knowledge, but we're moving that kind of one step further. Um, and we, we would call this um, promising practice. <coughs> um, and then we have what we consider his third level of knowledge or evidence, which is unwarranted assertions. And this is can be generated by any, anyone. And this is the stuff that you know, you find on Wikipedia, it might, it might be true, it may not be true, and it's what we wouldn't suggest you use to guide your practice. Um, so, moving to evidence in practice, there's a lot of terms that are bandied around. Um, there's no one term. Uh, we have, you know, evidence-based policy in practice, evidence-informed, these are the two probably most commonly used that you'll hear. And um, then we have evidence-influenced and evidence-aware. They're sort of just talking about the spectrum of evidence that's used within practice, so, you know, an awareness of evidence in the practice right up to what we would call evidence-based practice. As I said, there's no one definition, and it really depends on how you're going to use the evidence, what you need it for. Um, evidence-based practice is probably the most commonly used term that you've heard. And this actually came um, out of the... Um, uh, out of the medical fraternity in the 90s and it, um, it was sort of there was an assumption that it could be moved from from medicine into other areas such as <coughs> education welfare um, but it's a little bit it's a there's criticisms of it because um, it's a lot easier to show outcomes in a medical um, arena where you know you might have a broken arm and then you fix it and then the arm is fixed and it's easy to see an outcome whereas when you're working with people it's a lot more complex there's a lot more um, assumptions and influences that need to be taken into consideration when you're looking at the outcomes. Um, so, although um, it is there, it's not necessarily the, the, the terminology and the methodology that most people use, which is why I guess there's the, the term evidence informed. And this is seen by many as better conveying that decisions are guided or influenced by the evidence, um, but they're not based solely upon the research evidence. There's other factors that come into play when you're looking, when you're um, working in practice. And that's where, um, so Aaron Schlonsky and Michelle Ballon, they're Australian researchers, they came up with a view of evidence-based practice, which is, um, it nicely encapsulates the types of evidence that can be included. And this, this um, definition is that, so when you're looking at evidence-based practice, it includes research evidence, practitioner expertise, and clients' values and expectations. Um, and so it, it sort of takes into, it recognises that research evidence doesn't always exist for the practices that you're um, involved in, that research might be slightly behind where you're at, that there are certain circumstances where the, where the practice has moved on but the evidence base hasn't caught up yet. Say, for example, technology, you know, service delivery via technology, 
often research takes a lot, lot longer than um, the movement of technology. So, so sometimes we're playing catch up from a research perspective, and that's why this this um, definition allows for other types of evidence to be included. And what they say is that you should optimise the combination. So when there is a strong research base, use the research to inform your practice. But when there's not a strong research base, but you have strong client um, preferences or you have um, strong practitioner wisdom, use those and act accordingly based on those. Now one of the things that we need to look at before we look at um, what underpins evidence-based practice is is when um, practitioners are actually most likely to use it. Uh, it's, this is important for organisations to understand, and um, so there's a, a little bit of evidence about when <coughs> practitioners will use research evidence, and, and this is when, when it fits with the knowledge that you've gained already via hands-on experience, and this makes sense. It fits with what you already know, it makes sense, and you're more likely to use it. Um, that it's easy to implement and use, and this is, you know, this is, uh, a very important one because we understand that often um, practitioners are very overloaded, time poor, don't have time to go and read and research and assimilate research into practice. Um, and that's actually probably where CFCA, the organisation that I work for, um, fits in because what we do is actually a lot of syn synthesis of research and we look at the best ways to make it accessible to practitioners. Um, I'll talk to you a little bit about that later. And finally, that it's adaptable to suit the act agency or practitioner needs. So it's contextualised to what you're actually doing. Just having a big 30 page research report, if it's not applicable to what you're doing, you need actual how do we use this. So that's also part of what CFCA does. We do a lot of practitioner resources where we take the research and we turn it into short, sharp pieces that show you this is what you do in your practice. And then I guess apart from individual reasons um, to use or not use evidence-based practice, there's also organisational factors. And you know, we need to recognise that organisational factors can influence the uptake of research practice. There needs to be organisational support for the use of evidence in practice. And these are some of the influences that the literature suggests um, can affect at the organisational level the use of research. This is leadership attitude. So you need to have a champion. You need to have someone that's supportive of the use of evidence, that um, champions the project that you know, is very supportive of um, and encouraging of the use of evidence. Staff resources, we know that staff are time poor, they need to have the time and the skills to use the research. Um, if, if you've got organisational stress or financial pressure, obviously using evidence is a low priority. There are certain management types associated with the use of evidence in practice, so there are management types that are more amenable to using evidence. Um, the the organisation's tolerance for change, and the culture of experimentation and risk taking. And that's one of the biggest risks when um, we're pushing evidence-based practice is that organisations will lose that ability to be innovative and creative in the services that they're providing. You know, we still want services to be flexible and adaptable to the needs of their clients as they arrive. So that's one of the risks with pushing evidence-based practice too strongly. So I just wanted to point out that we've got we actually have a paper on developing a culture of research and evaluation, um, and from that we've, we've highlighted that, orga that organisations that, um, that do have a culture of um, evaluation and research, they deliberately seek evidence into or in order to better design and deliver their programs. And they can deliver evidence to stakeholders that programs are achieving desired results, enable robust decision making and support um, professional development. And this, you know, the benefits of this is that it helps to reinforce reflective thinking, that it helps staff to be responsive to external demands for accountability, which are only likely to, you know, increase as time goes on. Um, that they have increased confidence in having evidence, you know, that evidence does have a positive impact, and that staff gain new skills and knowledge. So this is where I want to start talking about actually um, implementing evidence in practice. I'm part of a project, it's called the Expert Panel Project, the rough details are up there, I'm not going to go into great de lot of detail, but basically it's a project, a DSS funded project to increase capacity and use of evidence based programs in DSS funded um, <coughs> family and children activity service organisations. So working a lot with community for children organisations, I don't know if you have a, you have a community for children's area, I think Dubbo, has, yeah. Um, so that's a five year project, we're about halfway through and we've sort of We've learned a lot through that project and I think that's what's going to guide the next few um, slides. 
So from the project, we've learned that um, uh, implementing evidence in practice is it's a journey and it takes a long time. It's a cultural change, it's an organisational change, it's a, an individual change. And so the way that we've um, been working with organisations is to help them along the journey in, a, in an inclusive and nudgy sort of way, not in a this is the way you have to do it, because we realise that um, you know, sometimes things are easier said than done. So, um, so we've come up with five principles that we use. So we, what we do, part of the project is that we assess programs for, to, to see if they're evidence-based, basically. And we've set a minimum criteria, which is the ones I'm going to talk through, for what we consider minimum requirements for program planning and design. So this is not saying this is the, you know, Rolls-Royce of evidence-based practice. This is a starting point. So this is, these are five principles that you can incorporate into your practice and um, think about talk with your managers about that, that might help move you down that pathway. So the first thing is, and I'll talk through these in a little more detail, but I'll just go, run you through them. <coughs> the program or practice has a theoretical and, and or research background. The program or practice has a program logic or a theory of change. Activities in the program or practice generally match good practice in meeting the needs of the target group. An evaluation has established that the practice or program has positive benefits for the target group and staff members are qualified and or trained to run the program or practice. So these are the five principles that we consider are a minimum requirement for evidence-based practice. So going, delving a little, a little deeper into those, um, so the first step is that your practice needs to have a theory or research basis for it. Um, so you need to consider if your practice is based on a theory or an explanatory framework that describes the relationship between the activities that you do and the outcomes that you expect. So, for example, um, attachment theory, that's a common one that a lot of programs base themselves on, which, you know, suggests that a primary, that um, secure attachment with a primary caregiver, very simplistically, leads to good outcomes for children. So, a program may include activities that help the formation of secure attachments, such as increasing a parent's ability to recognise and effectively respond to baby interests. So, that's the activity that's based on a theory to lead to the outcomes that you're looking for. Um, so these are some questions to think about. You know, does something already exist that's proven to work or that can reliably inform the practice that you're doing? Is there a theory out there? And probably most of the work you're doing is based on some sort of theoretical background, I think. Um, what's already known about the target group that you're, that you're working with? You know, what is the evidence for what works with this particular group? And you need to have a clear pathway from your research framework or background to the activities and then the outcomes. There has to be a clear causal link. And that's what I should have said in the earlier slide is that um, these five things are not separate, they're interlinked. You have to have one with the logical link to the other, logically linked to the other. You know, your, your theory has to underpin your program logic which where your activities have to be based on your theory to lead to your outcomes. So program logic, there's a lot of names for program logic theory of change, logic model, program theory. Um, basically what it is, it's a visual representation of what's going on in your program and service. Um, they're very useful things and we found in the project that I'm working on that when organisations go through the process of um, developing a program logic, it really pulls out flaws in the thinking and, and sometimes some areas where people haven't actually made that link between what we want to happen and how we're actually going to get there. So they're really good. I would recommend if you don't have one for the service that you do, having a look at them. Um, so basically what they are is that they, um, so there's two aspects to them. The relationships, which is between your, as I said, your theory, your background theory, your activities and your outcomes. There has to be an if-then relationship in your program logic. So if you do one, then you'll get the next. You know, so it's, it's a logical, and you need to have an intention. There needs to be a roadmap for your service or program with clearly defined outcomes. Um, this is a link, and I've um, told Tessica that I'll make, make the slides available to um, some information on um, program logics. Now, I'll just show you one. So <laughs> we thought that if we were going to talk the talk, we should walk the walk. So we've created a program logic for our expert panel project. It's probably not very, oh, it is quite clear up there. Um, 
So basically what it's showing you is that this is a pretty standard template. Um, there are a multitude of ways you can do program logics, but this one is pretty easy, I think. Um, but basically what it shows you is that, um, so these are your inputs, this is what you're putting into your service or program. These are the outputs, um, so your activities and your participants. And then from there you come out with your short-term, long-term and medium-term goals. And your goals need to be measurable. Your outcomes need to be measurable. So you may have an aspirational one at the end in your long term that's not as easy to measure, but you need to make sure that when you're um, thinking about the outcomes of your program, that, that the outcomes that you're considering are actually measurable. And that they're all causally linked. So the next process, I guess, in um, implementing evidence-based practice is that you need to test it. You need to see that it actually works. You need to show that the program or service is actually having an effect on children and families that's positive, that you're not doing any damage, really, um, at a minimum. So, yeah, so why evaluation? I've just put up some reasons why you might do it. Quality assurance, so that's checking that your service meets standards. Um, did participants benefit? And this is where we've kind of seen a shift from evaluation that says, you know, did you like the program? Was the venue lovely? You know, um, which tells you that they liked your program, but it doesn't actually tell you anything about the effects of the program. It doesn't tell you what works. Um, and also then evaluation to show that it, it actually, um, they benefited because of your program, not for some other reason and your program happened to be running at the same time or your service was running at the same time. And then an important feature of evaluation is how you can uh, adapt or improve your program. There may be, you may find aspects of it that aren't working so well or are working well and you may want to modify it. So evaluation is really good for identifying areas for improvement. Um, a process evaluation will show you if the implementation was true to your service or program design. So that's really important because quite often you might not get the outcomes that you're looking for if you haven't actually implemented it. So that's a really, implementation is a really important aspect of this. And then, you know, one of the bottom lines that we all are aware of is that we need to justify our request for further funding and support from funding bodies. So evaluation is becoming more and more a key criteria for that. If you can show that your program works, it's more likely to look at funding to borrow. <coughs> um, so these are some questions that you can, um, that evaluations can attempt to answer. Um, so, how do we know if our service or program has achieved its intended outcomes? How do we know we've successfully engaged families and met their needs? And if it has worked, how do we know how to keep going or to re replicate the initiative elsewhere? So that's how do we take it from this target group and move it to another target group? How can we use it elsewhere um, in our service delivery area? So I guess the main point I wanted to make was that um, evaluation doesn't have to be complex, it doesn't have to be hard, it doesn't have to run for five years. It can be as simple as just changing your intake um, processes to have a very short scale that may have three or four items on it, you know, that you take at the start, during and after. It, it doesn't have to be huge and scary, it can be quite a simple process. Um, I mean, obviously you will need resources, it's not, you do need time and a little bit of effort, but it doesn't have to be um, complex. There's also a lot of experts out there. As part of the project that we're work, working on, we've, um, we had organisations tender to become members of what's called the industry list, and they're experts in evaluation plan, planning, implementation and design, um, and outcomes measurement, and so they're out there if you, you know, if you need access to experts, there's a lot of them out there. Um, so what I've got to do is I'll just run through a quick evaluation case study, just to show you um, pros and cons of different aspects of evaluation. It's really quick, um, but it just gives you kind of that sort of overview of what the benefits of evaluation are. So we came up with Sunny Families, which is a program for vulnerable primary school age children and their parents. It's based loosely on a lot of the programs that we see um, that we're evaluating. The program has the following clearly defined objectives. It wants to increase an increase in positive communication between parent and child, and it wants improved child social skills. So the program is run at a local school for an hour each day after school, and parents are expected to attend. So scenario one is we do evaluation sheets. Parents are surveyed at the end of the term and asked whether they liked the program and what they thought about the venue. This is what I talked about before. So it's great that you know that they like the program. What's not so good is you don't know if the program had any effect on the outcome. The next option is you do an outcome survey. 
may just be a couple of questions that you ask. Parents are surveyed at the end of term and asked about improvements in the communication between them and their child and whether their child's social skills have been improved. So they're actually asking about the outcomes of the program. <coughs> so what's good is that you have some indication whether parents think the program's made a difference. What's no, not so good is that you didn't take a measure at the start, so you don't know if there's actually been a change. Um, and also, <laughs> parents might feel obliged to tell you that it's made a difference because they like you and you know, they've been interacting with you. So scenario three is pre and post testing. So this is where you survey them at the start and the end. Pretty easy, short, um, sharp. So you, it's good because you can see if there's an improvement or not over the term. What's not so good is that you can't be sure that it was the program that was responsible for the improvement. Um, and you can't be sure that the improvement wouldn't have happened anyway. You know, like with an illness, they may have got better at the anyway. <coughs> they may have been, you know, reading a lot more books outside of the program, so their improvement, you know, it could be a lot of factors that you haven't taken into account. So then we, scenario four, slightly more rigorous, we do pre and post testing with a comparison group. So um, in that case, we're talking about a naturally occurring comparison group. So it might be a waiting list for the program or service that you're offering. You might use a waiting list um, group. So what you do is you'd um, survey both the parents in the program and the parents who are on your waiting list at the start. So what it does is it gives you greater confidence that change has occurred as a result of the program. But again, you can't be sure that the comparison group aren't different to your the group that are undergoing the service because the children on the wait list might have less serious issues, you know, for example. Um, it can also be ethically problematic if you're delaying um, access to a program simply for evaluation purposes. Um, yeah, and like we said, you know, they, the waiting list group could be accessing other things outside of the program that's improving things for them just as much as your program. So then we come to, you know, randomised controlled trial, which is where you have... Um, where you randomly allocate two groups to it, one gets the service, one doesn't get the service. Um, this is your sort of gold standard. Um, you can, you know, you can clear, it limits the amount of bias because you randomly pick the groups. So you can, you know, have pretty good confidence that any change that you should see is due to the program. The not so good about this is that it can be expensive and dif difficult to implement in the service environment. <coughs> it's also the ethics, again, of having a group that don't receive the service. And depending on the critical nature of the service, and that can be a real issue. Um, so in the in the um, the project that I've just been talking about, the minimum standard that we required was that the program had to be evaluated with a minimum of twenty um, clients, and that it had to have a before and after and a comparison group. It didn't have to be an RCT to meet our minimum requirement. Okay, so now I just wanted to. I'm moving a lot quicker. Than I we might finish early. Um, I just wanted to go through outcomes versus outputs versus outcomes because I know this in the project that we're working on, we get a lot of questions about this. What's the difference? So, and why do we have to move to outcomes? So, outputs really can only give you point in time data. They 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 can provide useful information. You know how many people attended a program, how many sessions somebody. Um, some, each client attended, but they don't measure really whether the program's been effective or not in their <coughs> terms of objectives. So that's where outcomes come into it. And we've, this is on our website, and I'll keep, uh, the links will be available. I've left some of the flyers over there which have all the links available. Um, we put to, together a document that will, that's about how to choose an outcomes measure for evaluating your program. So the first thing you need to do, and this is all in line with the steps that you've already done. So choosing your theoretical basis, you know, creating a program logic, having clear activities that are linked to your theory and your outcomes, and having some clearly defined outcomes. So you need to clearly state what your service is intending to change. What's the outcomes you're looking for? And these are what you've already identified in your program logic. And as I said before, your outcomes may be long term, but generally you use an outcomes measurement till for short or medium term um, outcomes. And then you need to identify what level of program, what level of change your program actually targets. So you're looking at individual level um, or community level change, you know, because the outcomes measurement tool you choose will be affected by the level of change that you're looking for. So then, you know, the next step is to explore what existing tools are available to measure your identified outcomes. And you can, there's two options there. You can use an existing tool or you can develop your own. We've got an instrument decision tree, which is the 
couple of slides down which I'll show you, which can help with that. It just kind of sets out how to do it. Um, but what we would suggest is that ideally you choose an existing tool because they've often been used and reported on, rigorously tested, shown to be reliable and valid. Which <coughs> validity purely means that the tool measures what it says it's going to measure. So if it says it's measuring, you know, behaviour change, it measures behaviour change. And reliability is that if you give the same child the same test over and over, you'll get the same result. It just means that it's reliable. Um, so this is the instrument to decision making tree, which is just about how you choose um, an outcomes measure, whether or not you um, choose an existing one, choose one that hasn't, um, sorry, create your own steps that you go through. So what we've put on our website, and you know, we've got a whole bunch of information on our website about this, is a list of some commonly used outcomes tools. So these are tools that have been found to be reliable, found to be valid, easy to um, implement. Um, most of them are short, quite short scale, easy to use, um, that can be, that are commonly used in family and children's services. So these were the ones we went out to, this is DSS funded family and children's services, but we went out and we surveyed the landscape to see what are the tools that, that they're mostly using. And all of these tools have also been converted to um, the DSS score system, which I don't know if any have to report to, but there's actually a score in um, translation on the website as well. So these are some um, some commonly used ones, um, freely available, and there's also some links on our website to some um, to some sites that have heaps of them. So there's pretty much an outcomes measurement tool for most outcomes you're measuring, unless it's something really really near the wacky. Um, so we would suggest using ones that have already been created and tested. Now there are a couple of things you may need to adapt the tool in some way, and we. We'd say be very careful with doing this because any any adaptation could change what you're measuring. So if you are going to adapt a tool, we would strongly suggest you work with the developers of the tool to make sure that any adaptations, because you may need to make adaptations for the group that you're working with. It may be around the language that's in the tool, or you know that because of the group that you're working with. But we'd suggest that you um, work with the developer before making any changes, just to make sure that you're not messing with the actual meaning of the outcomes tool. You can also create your own, as we said, but um, this is a time-consuming product and uh, process, and you need to actually then test it. So we, this is not something we recommend, um, and this is where we've found in the past when people have created their own, they haven't necessarily actually been measuring what they think they're measuring. You know, I've been involved in evaluations where we've um, we've been given the tool that they've surveyed, and it actually has nothing in it. The survey will have nothing in it to do with the outcomes of the program. So you know the. For example, a mindfulness parenting program where they asked about behaviour change, behaviour change in the child. And there was nothing in the program that had anything to do with behaviour change in children, but that's what they were measuring. So you have to be very careful if you're going to create your own survey tools. Um, as I said, lots of information on our website. Now, one thing I just wanted to quickly talk about was, um, so I know there's a lot of there's a lot of sort of talk about client feedback and, and measuring outcomes in individual practice. And we've done some, um, Lauren Maloney, one of the um, very respected researchers at ACE, um, did some research recently about outcomes measures in um, individual therapy and relationship therapy and counselling. Um, because again, they're getting the same push by funding bodies to show um, outcomes. So what he said is that there's from the research that he looked at, there's um, there's much to be said for promoting a feedback <coughs> information culture by the use of instruments that are validated, sufficiently brief, um, sufficiently brief for agencies and their funding bodies to be willing to endorse their everyday use and can be employed along across a wide variety of clients in a range of settings and languages and that are freely available. So he identified these two tools. Um, they're freely available, they're a four item tool. They can be used um, in every session of a counseling or therapy situation. And, and they've, been, um, they've been found to, the use of these tools have been shown to um, increase rates of reliable change in clients and also reduce deterioration rates in both individual and couples counseling. A really easy way to, to measure outcomes in individual therapy. And there's information on the website. And then the other thing, I guess, is if your um, program or your service is targeted at a broader level, if it's targeted at a community wide level. Now, um, 
there is not there are not a lot of tools out there for measuring um, outcomes at the community wide level. Um, there are ways to do it. Uh, generally, the, these are the four most commonly used, so they have pros and cons. Each of them, you can survey a representative sample of your community, so that's where you go out and you go broad and you survey your community. Which um, the advantage is you get a very broad understanding of whether something has worked. Uh, the disadvantage is that it's timely, time intensive, costly. The other option is you use key informants in the community to um, find out whether an activity is working in, in, in achieving the outcomes you're aiming for, or focus groups. Again, they can be, the advantage is that they're less costly, can be done a lot quicker, but the disadvantage is that you might not be doing an actual representative of what's happening in your community, so you might not actually be finding out um, the real outcomes of your program. Um, there's a lot of push to use secondary resource data. So this is your AEDC, your ABS, your um, strategy stuff that was discussed before. Um, this data can be very useful. What's really very useful is for identifying needs. So that sort of information can be really good for finding um, need in your community. So looking at where to target your programs and your services. In terms of using it to actually measure outcomes, it's a little more difficult um, because those, those huge secondary sources of data aren't necessarily designed to measure the outcomes that you're looking for. So if you're looking for, say, something broad like increased social I don't know, social capital or something, those sorts of um, data sets aren't going to give you that information. The other problem is a lot of those data sets are at a higher level. There's not a lot of local community and lower um, large data sets or, and they're not easy to access. So there's pros and cons to both of those uh, mixed methods. That's just mixing the um, one ten fold, your big and your little to make it a little bit easier. But as it says there, there's a lack of practical tools to measure um, community-wide outcomes. We do have a paper that's um, called Demonstrating Community-Wide Outcomes, and it has some tools and links in it that, um, that can provide you with some information on how to do it. Um, and these are some of the questions to consider if you're actually demonstrating community-wide outcomes. I won't read through them. Um, I'll make the slides available. So you can, if you are looking at community-wide outcomes, you can um, have a look. And also, they're in the paper on the website. Now, I guess I just wanted to end, that didn't take long, did I zoom through that? Um, with a bit of a discussion about the organisation that I work for. So if you want to have evidence-based practice, um, we are a key source of evidence. So our, we're an information exchange for practitioners, policy makers and um, researchers, looking at protecting children, supporting um, families and um, strengthening communities. So we, we, our job is basically to synthesise the research out there and make it accessible for you. So we do that through a range of things. We've got long publications, we've got short practitioner resources. We do webinars monthly. Um, I don't know if any of you are signed up to our e-alert. If anybody, I put a sign-up sheet up there. Um, basically, it's a fortnightly alert that tells you what's going on in the sector, news, training, any free training that's being offered, any resources that come out, um, when our webinars are happening. They're usually just uh, an hour-long webinar, um, middle of the day type thing, so you can do it over lunch. Um, which cover a range of topics. Um, we also have, um, yes, yeah, so our publications and papers, um, some soon to be released publications. Today we actually released the effects of trauma on the brain um, for children in care. Uh, it's a practitioner resource, so it's a really good one. And we're coming up with um, a worker retention paper, Caring for Our Child Protection Workforce. That's going to be some tips and hints. Um, and improving outcomes for young people leaving out of home care is another paper. Um, we do short articles, they're 400 words long, practitioner corners articles where practitioners actually offer their insight into their practice and what's working and what's not working. And you're always welcome to contribute, we are always looking for people to contribute. Um, and, as, and we've also got a bunch of research and practice profile databases. Um, as you said in your introduction, I've just been working on the Protecting Australia's Children's Research um, Audit, which we collated research on um, anything to do with protecting Australian children and the national framework from the last five years. That's going to be an online register available in the next week. Um, there's 930 um, projects that we've found in the last five years related to protecting Australian children. We're going to be synthesising those, so hopefully in the next coming 
I'm not necessarily my next job, um, to, into something useful to tell you about what the research is um, telling us. And hopefully we'll be looking at the priorities of the national agenda um, to see what's out there. Um, we also have the evidence-based program profiles, which are the ones, so when I talked about the criteria for evidence-based pro programs, this was a base level that we tested at, programs that left um, met a higher standard, so it could be replicated, had been replicated, had gone through a more rigorous evaluation, were put onto this um, program profile. So it's like a guidebook of evidence-based programs. So if you're looking for something to actually um, meet a need that you've got, the only problem is, is that a lot of them are parenting programs and not everybody wants a parenting program. So, but they're up there if you need them. Um, that's the register I just talked about. Uh, we've also got resources for sort of supporting the work of the third action plan and we've got a help desk and this is probably the best thing you can take out of this if you've got a question about evidence in practice send us an email give us a phone call because we're there to actually answer those questions so our job is to help you um, use evidence in your practice so we are more than happy to answer questions and also to hear what you want to know about. So, you know, we have an advisory group that advises us on what, what's needed in the sector, but we're always happy to hear from the doctors and the sector. Um, and as I said, subscribe to our e-alert and you'll find out when things are coming up. Well, that was fascinating. Are there any questions? Yes. I, I note um, when you mentioned about evaluation, you never you never sort of referred to the RBA results based accountability. No. The methodology. No. Because that's not part of what we're doing. <coughs> yeah, but that's quantitative and qualitative. Yeah. And a lot of the um, so a lot of the a lot of the organisations who have programs that aren't meeting our very minimal requirement yeah. are going out to um, organisations on the industry, there's not experts in planning and, and evaluation and they are using the um, RBA, that's yeah, their yeah. methodology for them yeah, doing for, the Because that's so what yeah. basically we've tried to implement, it seems to give you a real outcome. Yes. And a real, it's a real gauge of measurement. So what, we, so what we did was we set a very minimum requirement okay. in, this, in this particular project. Yeah, that's going to give you a higher level of Yeah, quality. well we, we actually use that in our yeah. children's services. I mean, yeah. it's unbelievable and ask them, let them develop the questions around it. Yeah. 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 It's interesting that you never refer to that thought. Because I'm talking, I guess, what I wanted to give you was a very... Um, right line, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, where to start. Sure. Yeah. Right, thank you. Any other questions for Catherine? Where do we sign up for the email? Yes. Oh, up there? Yeah. Those um, things that are going to be coming up, the, the books, the, the papers, yeah. Yeah, they don't cost anything. No, no, everything's free and available on the website, yeah. We're, um, yeah. Although we're an independent agency, we're government. That? So yeah. everything's accessible. So will the information be available after the conference? Yes. So I've told Jessica that you can have the, the um, yeah. slides if you want them. Um, on the flyer that's next to the sign up sheet is um, information and links to everything on our website. So it'll run you through what I've, just the links basically to what I've talked about. Any other questions? No, I'm quick. If there was anything that I skipped through. Yeah. I guess one of the questions I had, because I'm very much around evaluation, um, I guess most of, yeah, I guess most of the organisations here in the rural sector, as you know, are quite small. Oh, yes, and I did mean to actually discuss yeah. this. So with the, with the project that we've been working on, one of the biggest, yeah, so one of the biggest <coughs> issues that we've had is um, rural and remote organisations being able to evaluate their programs, yeah. 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 Um, because of those things, because small client bases, small towns, everybody knows everybody. Um, so what has actually happened, this has been raised by so many communities around Australia that um, the government, as part of the expert panel project, has actually funded um, certain organisations, uh, I don't know if it's been publicly announced yet, to um, go, uh, to work with rural and remote communities to build their capacity around evaluation and to, to deal with some of these issues. So that project's just starting, well, it's just been awarded, so it'll be happening over the next year. Probably next so, so how are they gonna pick who they're going to work with or what communities they're going to? 
It's based around children's and communi uh, communities for children sites, um, and I think 17 sites. I'm not completely sure of the details, but it's just been announced. Um, but the government, uh, DSS, has chosen the sites. Yeah. I think they um, went out and let people um, contact them if they wanted to be a part of it. It's a sort of opt-in process. Can I just ask you something? We've, uh, I manage a very small service, um, and we've just uh, semi-completed an evaluation pro uh, project on um, in, in partnership with Health on a parenting program that we deliver. And because um, it had a finite time, we haven't finished um, interviewing the number of people that we want to interview. So we have put a, an interim report out. Um, are we able to get some assistance from you on going on with that? What's the best way of, because we don't have the support of health doing oh, it now. Yes, you can certainly um, contact us if there's questions. Yes, it's, it's quite a big report that we put out and what um, sort of... It's a parenting program, uh, child protection parenting program that we wanted to evaluate. Yep. Um, and we wanted to, we want to eventually work work it up so that it becomes evidence-based. Yeah. So then we would probably suggest working with the industry <coughs> list, the group of experts that... So those, those people on that, there's 43 organisations, they went through a tender process um, to basically quality assure that they had the skills that they said they had and so and we then quality assure the process so we're sort of like the matchmaker yeah like you come to us with your need and we match you with the appropriate organization to do the work okay so we can we can um, provide advice but we can't actually do the evaluation or you know well we probably get we've, we've probably got the people to to do well but even yeah. in terms of planning, I just need, need, I, need, need. I need to probably get some support because we won't have the support we, of, of health officially um, now because the program, the project itself is finished. But we want to go on because we're still delivering the program. So we're going to be interviewing clients who are currently going through, you know, several months after the program. So it's, it's an ongoing thing for a certain time. Um, it would be really good to to talk to somebody who's an expert on doing it to see how we're travelling. Well, that's what um, I would suggest the industry. Yeah, okay, great. So I can... But the details are on the flyer. <coughs> yeah, got the flyer. Feel free. I grabbed that flyer very, very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So would that be the same if you wanted to carry out some sort of longitudinal study over a brief period of time? Yeah, yeah. Yes, definitely. But that's why with our project we sort of focused on short and medium term because you know people need to be able to show to funding bodies that their program works but most organisations don't have five years to, to, to look at the outcomes you know so that's why we would strongly recommend focusing on your short and medium term outcomes to begin with. And yes, longitudinal um, research is great and that would give you very strong space. Obviously, that takes time, money, resources. So yes, we can certainly help you with some extra. Any other questions or requests? Okay, we're just on behalf of the organising committee, Catherine. We want to say thank you very much for your effort.